Watch this. Some Idahoans who are fully vaccinated are still getting COVID. Does that mean the vaccine doesn't work? Not exactly. Some context on breakthrough cases. Blaine County has the state's highest vaccination rate. Nearly 90% of those eligible have had the shot. And hospitals say that's making a difference. Before the end of the year, Idaho's House of Representatives will have to reconvene. We hear from House Speaker Scott Bedke on when that might be. He also had a thing or two to say about Representative Priscilla Giddings, who accused him of playing political games. She dedicated her life to public service, which is why Idaho's largest city has made a dedication to her with the official opening of a park named for Cherie Buckner Webb. There's a long list of new terms that we've had to learn these last 18 months or so. Pandemic protocols, social distancing, flattening the curve, remember that? Zoom links, and lately, breakthrough cases. That's when someone who is fully vaccinated still gets infected with COVID-19. These breakthrough cases are becoming more common with the Delta variant becoming more common. It's now the dominant strain of the coronavirus in the US and in Idaho. So does that mean the vaccine doesn't work? Well, no. In fact, health experts are pointing to breakthrough cases and using it as more evidence for why you should get vaccinated. Why is that? Because yes, a fully vaccinated person can get COVID, likely more will, but getting the vaccine may keep you alive and out of the hospital. Here's Katya Stepovic. We ended up taking a family trip um, to Eastern Idaho and Yellowstone Park and that. Um, and when we returned um, is, is when we found out. James McGurdy's wife tested positive for COVID-19 days after they returned from their trip. She had been fully vaccinated since February. Why? We've done everything we're supposed to be. We wore masks when we were supposed to be. got vaccinated. How is this us? A couple days later, his mom tested positive for the virus too, and she was also fully vaccinated. While James never got tested, he's confident he had it. I did lose a uh, sense of taste and smell for a couple of days, not very long. My symptoms were very, very mild. We were shocked, um, again, because of everything that we'd read with, you know, the chances of getting it are very low. But as we have learned, while the chances of contracting the virus are low, it does happen. The Idaho Department of Health and Welfare is reporting 1,154 breakthrough cases in Idaho. In late June, that number was 445. As is the case with any type of a vaccine, um, no vaccine is perfect, but so breakthrough cases will occur and they are occurring. Dr. John East, director of pulmonology and critical care services at St. Alphonse's, says not only are breakthrough cases very rare, but symptoms will be mild. Uh, what we really worry about are the serious infections where people's health is at threat or their life is at threat. And we know the vaccines are still protecting people who've been vaccinated from those problems. And, and it is very unusual um, to, to have a serious illness if you've been vaccinated. So, so the best protection, you know, far and away, is is to get the vaccine. Dr. East says when the level of infections in a community are high, the probability of the vaccinated getting infected increases. So the solution, he says, is simple. The studies have proven that not only they're safe, that they're effective, and the risk profile versus the benefit, it, it it's it's clearly well in favor of the benefit, right? The, the risks are negligible when you're talking about administering this vaccine to a broad population. As for James and his family, they credit the vaccine for keeping them out of the hospital and alive. I feel that, yeah, we got sick, but the vaccine worked and that nobody was hospitalized. What the experts told us ended up helping us in the long run. Um, and despite the fact that we were a little scared when we first found out it was it was positive, you know, things turned out um, well for us. He doesn't know if they came down with the Delta variant or not, but Idaho Health and Welfare sent us this statement on the topic, saying in part, the Delta variant of the SARS-CoV-2 virus does appear to be more likely to result in vaccine breakthrough infect infections than the variants that were circulating earlier in 2021. Dr. E says that the Delta variant accounts for more than 90% of the cases in the United States, and he says Idaho is no different. He urges those who are not vaccinated to do so, especially ahead of the new school year. Ryan. 
And I think it was like of half the states in the country reporting these breakthrough cases regularly, only about 1% of those are breakthrough cases of those vaccinated, only 1%. And then another number for you, Katya, the CDC says less than 0.001% of fully vaccinated people have died from a breakthrough case of COVID-19. So it's very, very small. Well, 95% effective is not 100% effective. We know that the vaccine isn't perfect, much like any other form of protection we may choose in life from seat belts to birth control. But it is the most effective way, as you heard Dr. E say, to keep you from getting seriously sick from the coronavirus. Majority of Idahoans still haven't been vaccinated, which means this virus still has a lot of room to roam around the gem state. For example, yesterday's reported 680 COVID cases, the most that we've seen since January 20th. Prior to the vaccine becoming more available, those cases would often lead to increasing COVID patients in hospitals. And that's still the case, just not to the level we were seeing BV. That's before the vaccine. We heard some of those numbers yesterday from Idaho's three major health systems. Totals we haven't seen since February. What does that look like on a smaller scale, though? St. Luke's Magic Valley told us today they began seeing a surge in their community of positive COVID, in their community, that is, of positive COVID cases. They started seeing that surge just this week. But for the past two weeks, they've been pretty steady with about 20 to 25 patients in the hospital with COVID. That's a far cry from their peak in November, December of last year when it was in the 70s. So it sounds like we're in a much better situation, right? Well, remember, a spike in cases one week tends to lead to an increase in admitted patients a couple of weeks later. Right. Yeah, positive cases tend to correlate with uh, need for hospitalization. We, we, we see about 5% uh, in the history of the pandemic here in St. Luke's, about 5% of the patients that are test positive end up being admitted. Um, so, you know, as positives increase, you can kind of usually uh, portend that more people will end up in the hospital. Are you seeing the trend in the Magic Valley, like we're seeing everywhere else, where majority of the patients that end up getting admitted are not vaccinated? Oh yeah, yeah. No, it's 98% uh, uh, or so of the people admitted in the St. Luke's footprints uh, or are unvaccinated, yeah. Another number of significance is where they are starting when it comes to the summer census. This year, Dr. Kern says St. Luke's is seeing record number volumes of, well, everything, not necessarily just COVID. And we think that there's some combination of people are out and about more, so you're seeing more injuries. Uh, other viruses are spreading. So we are seeing, as an example, RSV uh, in pediatric patients. We're seeing a lot of RSV hospitalizations during a time of year where we typically don't see RSV pop, uh, uh, hospitalizations. But I think we sort of delayed a lot of other viral illnesses. So when you look at total hospital census, we had literally record low hospital census through the middle part of last summer when we had um, you know, made efforts to make sure that the hospital was cleared out. We were, you know, people were wearing masks. We saw hardly any viral illness, hardly any influenza. Um, so when, when we got our big surge, we, were, we started off at a much better spot than we are right now. We spoke to a nurse uh, in Magic Valley uh, a couple times over the last year and a half, Ryan Sharp. I feel like the community is giving up on us. There was like, a uh, obvious, and she made it very clear, but a kind of I, frustration. I, 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 uh, among the, uh, she, as she described it, among her peers with patients and with the whole situation. Is that still there? Or are we getting to a point now when it comes to healthcare workers? Is there like a fatigue setting in because it's like, here we go again? Yeah, the fatigue is real. I mean, I heard somebody saying like, oh man, I just, I'm feeling so beat down by this whole thing. In part, because I think many of us are frustrated because we now consider this almost a preventable disease when it comes to hospitalization. And so, you know, the Magic Valley, Twin Falls has a, about a 46% community vaccination rate. So again, a lot of hospitalizations, a lot of unnecessary illness and even death could be prevented by getting more vaccinations in people. Dr. Kern points to Blaine County as a great example of this. At one point, it was Idaho's hotspot for COVID. Now it leads the state in another stat, vaccinations. More than 87% over the age of 12 have been inoculated against COVID. So we do see less need for admitting patients, though they are having, you know, some increase in their uh, community COVID numbers. And interestingly, we've we've seen uh, some of the tourists, some of the people needing to be admitted were tourists with COVID uh, or that don't live full time uh, in Sun Valley and were unvaccinated. So a pretty interesting uh, occurrence up there. Yeah. 
And that's kind of, if you could hold one spot up as like, this is kind of what we want to see. That's right. 90% vaccination rate. That is, you know, that's oh, as good as you'll tend to get. Uh, and yeah, we, if we had that throughout the state of Idaho, the, the risk to our health systems would be way, way lower. And that high vaccination rate has meant Blaine County hasn't had to send COVID patients to the Magic Valley and fill up their ICU. Dr. Kern said more than half of St. Luke's Magic Valley ICU patients are fighting COVID. And all of those are attached to a ventilator. Dr. Kern reiterated medical experts believe the breakthrough rate with the Delta variant will be about 20%. But with the vaccine, it's less likely that 20% is going to end up in their hospital. We know Idaho's legislature has to get back together at some point. There's an ethics committee issue to deal with, but there likely won't be any talk about vaccine requirements, at least according to House leadership. Getting together is what we like to do every day, and that includes you. Send us a text message, and it might be one we share at the end of the show. Send them to this number, 208-321-5614. Make it a comment, a question, or even a complaint. Just make sure to include your name and the hashtag the 208. Today on the Olympic Zone. There hasn't been this much attention paid to a recess since that late 90s cartoon by the same name. Remember that show? Well, here we are in the midst of an extended recess with the Idaho legislature. So who's going to ring that bell to end it? And what will happen when that bell is rung? It's the question for lawmakers over at the Idaho State House. And while the Idaho Senate officially adjourned for the year back in the spring, the Idaho House technically still in session, which I think means both of them are technically still in session because you can't have one without the other, as I understand it. Well, before the end of the year, House leadership needs to call lawmakers back to adjourn for the year. They also were going to they are also going to consider recommendations from the House Ethics Committee now that their investigation and hearing into Representative Priscilla Giddings has wrapped up. Some lawmakers are also calling for the legislature to come back as a whole to consider action in regards to private medical employers or any employers requiring their employees to get a COVID vaccine. Joe Paris spoke with House Speaker Scott, Scott Bedke, man who gets a major say on when those lawmakers do come back. At some point this year, the Idaho House will return to Boise to at least formally adjourn for the year. So when will that be? And is it possible that lawmakers will consider passing new legislation? House Speaker Scott Bedke says that House leadership is currently weighing their options for a return before the end of 2021. People want to get finished with their vacations here in August. Uh, then you have the Thanksgiving, Christmas uh, time. We'll, we'll find a, a time there where we can come in as the original plan that we set back in May and, uh, and close up the books. Bedke says there has been plenty of conversations about possibly coming back into session, but he does note an interesting consensus between lawmakers about the requirements to do that. I'm in receipt of a bunch of phone calls and emails uh, from the members, 
And they would kind of like for us to follow the process that they are, that, that will be on the ballot next November, which is when we get 60% of, of the House and 60% of the Senate wanting to come back in on a specific issue, then critical mass is reached and we would come in. And that has not happened at this point. Uh, there's a lot of chatter, but there's no, uh, but, but the threshold has not been met. As Bedke alluded to, Idahoans will get to vote next fall on whether they think Idaho lawmakers should be able to call themselves back into session for specific topics to consider. A topic some lawmakers have pushed recently is the decision by private medical employers to require their employees to get a COVID vaccine in order to maintain employment. Some Republicans have called for Bedke and House leadership to call lawmakers back to consider action on the topic, but Bedke says he doesn't think most Idahoans agree. If you were to take a poll, I'm sure, of, of Idahoans and ask them whether or not they wanted politicians in the middle of their private businesses, I think the answer would be no, and maybe more emphatically than that. Betke says he understands there are lawmakers who personally disagree with the decision, but that lawmakers have a set role. These hospitals are private businesses. Would I run them as they have chosen to run? No, I wouldn't. I think that the, the, that I agree with the other hospitals in the state that the mandate for a vaccination at this point is a bridge too far. But that's not, that's not our decision. That is, that is the, uh, the administrators at those hospitals, the CEOs of St. Luke's and St. Al's and Primary Health. That is, that is their decision and it's between them and their employees. Some Republican lawmakers have asserted in recent days that because of the state and federal monies that hospitals receive, like Medicaid expenditures, that they're a quasi public agency that should not be allowed to tie employment to vaccine status. They believe lawmakers need to return to address the situation. They're entitled to their narrative, but they're not entitled to the facts. And the facts are is that they, there's a contract between the employer and the employee, and we've always stopped short of getting in the middle of that and I believe that that's the best course forward. When the Idaho House does return this year, they will also consider recommendations from the House Ethics Committee to censure and remove a committee assignment from Representative Priscilla Giddings. The committee unanimously found that Giddings acted in a manner unbecoming of a lawmaker. For weeks, Giddings and her supporters, though, have directly said that they think Bedke and House leadership used the ethics investigation to hurt her run for lieutenant governor, a race that Bedke is also in. Simply put, Bedke says this is not the case and that House leadership has stayed out of the situation per rules. We are completely removed from that and we will have a vote just like the other members of the, of the body, but we are outside of the process despite the allegations and assertions to the contrary. Those are completely false. That's a narrative that is, is, is not consistent with the facts and, and I believe everyone knows that. But it makes great political theater. That's what you're seeing being played out. So we'll wait and see what happens with the House. But there are two chambers in the legislature. So what do we know about the Senate? So the Senate did sign a die for the year officially. So they're they're essentially done for the year. But I asked Speaker Bedke if there's a situation where if for some reason the House came back and they got into new business and they started drafting up new legislation and they were to pass it, what would happen since the Senate has gone home? Well, there's an opinion that if for some reason the House brought up new business, which they're not expected to, and they did pass it and transmit it to the Senate, it's possible the Senate may have to come back and actually do something about it. So is the Senate done done for the year? We believe so. Is it possible they are back? Brian, as we've learned in Idaho <laughs> politics, anything can happen. Especially this year. Especially this year. And we spoke with Senator Chuck Winder earlier about this, and he wasn't even clear whether or not they're done done because they did sign a die, but the House didn't, so they didn't agree. So officially they're not done, which means I don't think it would take the governor to call them back. So they could still get together as a caucus and say, we need to go back and talk about this. Right. And, you know, spoiler alert, uh, speaking with Speaker Bedke this afternoon, it doesn't sound like that is a likely situation. It doesn't sound like the House would even try to act on anything outside of formally finishing for the year signy dying and also taking up the uh, ethics complaint recommendations from the House Ethics Committee. Because if there's one thing we have learned in the last year and a half, they want to have a plan before just starting to go at it willy nilly. Yeah, they don't want to waste taxpayer dollars by just going back and having conversations. They can do that when they get back in January. All right. Thank you very much, Joe. Cherie Buckner Webb and her family have played a vital role in Idaho for generations as civil servants and champions of civil rights. 
Today, Boise decided to honor that effort by naming their newest park after her. All right, it's up to you to keep the 208 conversation going. You have thoughts about the show? Send them to the show, to us. The number is 208-321-5614. Don't forget to include your name, maybe your hometown, and for sure, the hashtag, the 208. I think really just to say, Cherie Buckner Webb Park. Pretty impressive. Boise's newest park has now officially been named and dedicated and opened. Named after one of its most well-known politicians. About an hour ago, the city dedicated the new downtown park to Cherie Buckner Webb, you just saw. 11 years ago, she became the first black woman elected to the Idaho legislature. And today, the city is celebrating that and pretty much everything else that has to do with her legacy and her family's legacy. Five generations they've been here in Idaho and what they've all done for the city by naming this park after her. They kicked off the celebration, uh, as you can see there, with a ribbon cutting. And this park, by the way, if you haven't seen it, on the corner of Bannock and 11th in downtown Boise. That pink tree Over should there, tell you the you're in the right spot with the swings on it. And yep, people are enjoying them right now as the festivities are still going on for this evening. You still have time to head down. There's music, food, pop-up performances, live art exhibits, all of that taking place. And all of that is expected to last until about 9 o'clock tonight. So you still have plenty of time to get down there and enjoy it. A lot of people doing just that. Cherie, Senator Cherie Buckner Webb has been a longtime community leader for the state's largest city and a fierce advocate for civil rights. But it came at a cost because you may remember while she was growing up in Boise, she had a cross burned in her front yard because of the work her family did as civil rights activists. The family now been in Idaho. This would be seven generations. Her granddaughter there at her dedication today. And they still continue with that work that, well, her family began generations ago. Buckner Webb worked to create the Black History Museum, which is a museum her son, Philip Thompson, is very active about in, and also he's active in the community and handles these same issues. He runs that museum. That museum sits in the historic St. Paul Baptist Church. 
It's a place her grandfather, Cherie's great grandfather, once owned and ran. But her most noticeable achievement happened, as we mentioned, back in 2010 when she was elected to serve in Idaho's state legislature. We talked to her yesterday about what all this meant to her, and she got emotional about it, saying she was overwhelmed with joy. It's a powerful interview that you can watch for the first time or again, if you'd like, right now at ktvb.com. Sorry, out of time for your comments. We'll see you tomorrow.